Welcome to our Church at Home service, and I've come to peaceful Hensel Church today. And I hope that wherever you're watching this, you feel that same sense of God's peace with you that we feel in our church buildings. The Lord be with you. We come from scattered lives to meet with God. Let us recognise his presence with us. As God's people we have gathered. Let us worship him together. God our Father, we come to you in sorrow for our sins. So let's say together. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore to us the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Father forgive us by the death of his Son and strengthen us to live in the power of the Spirit all our days. The Collect Prayer for the eleventh Sunday after Trinity. God of glory, the end of our searching, help us to lay aside all that prevents us from seeking your kingdom and to give all that we have to gain the pearl beyond price through our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first reading today from Paul's letter to the Romans where he speaks of all the different members of the church as a body with different skills and gifts that they use to build up the body. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministry, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. This is the word of the Lord. And our Gospel reading is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 to 20. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. 
and whatever you bind on earth will be bound on heaven in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the messiah this is the gospel of the lord I've had some songs running through my mind as I prepared this sermon. And it wouldn't bless you if I sang them to you, I'm sure. But you might recognise some of them by a few lines. I can see clearly now the rain has gone. I can see all obstacles in my way. Or a couple of Christian songs. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. And John Newton's famous Amazing Grace. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Then there are those optical illusions. I'm sure that you've all seen them. Like the one where on first appearance it looks like you're looking at a vase. But as you gaze more closely, the faces of two people appear. And once you've seen it, from then onwards, your way of seeing things has been changed forever. And that's what's going on in the Gospel reading this morning for Peter. He sees Jesus for who he truly is. The Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the Living God. And Jesus responds by calling Peter the rock, a pun on his name, Petrus. And then he promises him to use him as a foundation stone on which to build his church. And yet, if you read on just a few verses later in Matthew 16, we see Jesus explaining to his disciples how he must go up to Jerusalem to suffer and to die. Peter, the rock, immediately jumps in. Never, Lord. This is never going to happen to you. And in return, Peter receives perhaps the sternest rebuke that Jesus ever delivers to one of his disciples. Get behind me, Satan. Within just a few short verses, Peter gets it so right and then so wrong. Why such a difference? We can find the clues in the text. Here, at the beginning of the narrative, we're told that Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi. And this we know to be a non-Jewish area north of the Sea of Galilee. And it was a region well known to be pagan and devoid of any faith in Yahweh. And it's this which is the setting for Peter's insightful declaration of faith. No doubt some of the other disciples were starting to think this. But the typically impulsive and pioneer Peter was the first to express it. You, Lord, are not just the reincarnation of John the Baptist spirit, or the spirit of Elijah, or some other great prophet. You are the Christ, the long-awaited Messiah, and the Son of the living God. And what did Jesus say? This was not revealed to you by man. It's, in other words, not human, secular understanding, the sort of thing that you might have expected in a region like Caesarea Philippi. This was revealed to you by my Father in heaven. It's the work of God, the Holy Spirit, revealing the truth to Peter. He is looking at Jesus now with the eyes of faith. So contrast this when Peter gets it wrong. What does Jesus say? Not just get behind me, Satan, but he says, you don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. So if before Peter was the rock on which to build, here he's the rock 
to stumble over. This time, Peter is looking at the situation not with the eyes of faith, but with secular human eyes, wanting things his way and not God's way. It seems to me that this is a challenge which we all face all the time. How do we see with the eyes of faith? How do we allow God to open the eyes of our hearts, as the songwriter puts it? And Paul is saying a similar thing in our reading from Romans this morning, Romans 12 in verse 2. How can we no longer conform to the pattern of this world, but be renewed by the renewing of our mind? Then it says you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. This is clearly not easy. Remember, Peter walked daily with Jesus and he still gets it right one day and yet so wrong the next. A pattern we see Peter demonstrating all the time throughout the Gospels, not least when he denies Jesus three times after his arrest. This, I think, is a helpful reminder not to beat ourselves up when we get it wrong. We're all a work in progress. None of us the finished article. But it's not easy. And if it's not easy, I don't think the way we can learn to see through the eyes of Jesus is that complicated. It's about spending more time with God. More time getting to know him and to trust him as we read his living word in the Bible. More time talking to him and listening to him in prayer. More time learning together in small groups and in our worship services. And more time opening ourselves up to the Holy Spirit working in our lives. Quite simply, spending more time with Jesus. Learning to look more and more with the eyes of faith and not with the eyes of the world. As I've talked to people over the last weeks and months of this awful COVID pandemic, it has been possible to see God moving powerfully in the midst of us all. And so often I've heard people say that they've been reading their Bibles more, using prayer guides and study notes prepared by their churches during the week, and praying more at home and prayer walking. And they've loved it. Perhaps it's because they haven't been able to follow their usual routine or to rely too heavily on the Sunday service. And so many people who, ha who, who I have talked to have said how much this has helped them to grow in their faith. The challenge today is to see the things like Peter did through the eyes of faith. And when we get back to normal, whatever that normal is, the challenge is not to lose the good things which we've been doing. Not reverting back to our old patterns of less, but continuing to seek more. More of God's word, more prayer, more of his Holy Spirit directing our lives. And not conforming to the pattern of this world, but allowing God to shape us as that ancient prayer of Richard, Bishop, Bishop of Chichester, so memorably put it. If we do this, we might seek to know Jesus more clearly, to love him more dearly, and to follow him more nearly, day by day. Amen. Let us declare our faith in God. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, 
who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now we bring our prayers of intercession. Let us pray for the church and for the world and thank God for his goodness. We pray for the church, the body of Christ in all its variety. May we all discern our roles within the body and use them for the building up of the whole. We pray for the ministers, teachers, prophets, givers, leaders, encouragers and pastors in our own church. That we would recognise the gifts of God given to us through them. Lord, in your mercy... We pray for the world, your beautiful creation. We give thanks for the harvest being gathered in around us. Help us to live in harmony with nature, as you created us to do, sharing generously the gifts of your creation. Lord, in your mercy. We remember the parts of the world marred by violence and destruction and pray for your spirit of peace and cooperation. We pray for governments that they may seek the common good without prejudice or favour. Lord, in your mercy, We pray for our young people receiving their exam grades this week and last, for peace in the midst of turmoil and disappointment, and for their teachers as they prepare to return to teaching next month within the restrictions. May they be strengthened to offer support to the students in their care. We lift to the Lord all who are suffering at this time, whether through anxiety or ill health, those we know and those we have been asked to pray for. We pray for them and all who care for them, that they will be enfolded in your loving care. Lord, in your mercy. We bring to the Lord the desires of our own hearts, confident that he will hear and answer us. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself. The power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in his service. The joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you all, those whom you love, this day and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. <laughs>